welcome to the Postal Mate webinar, How Does Coronavirus Affect Your Store? My name is Karen Grant, and I'm joined today by two folks from RS Associates. First of all, welcome to Brandon Gale. Good morning, Karen, and everybody out there. Thanks for having us as part of this. We're, uh, we're happy to help. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And then also from RS Associates, we have, who's going to be helping us with the questions in the background, Rhett Scarborough. Rhett, hello. Hi, everybody. So you can tell he had his, his phone on mute, so he had to get off mute. Um, and so we do anticipate a completely sold out full program today. So go ahead and type your questions in. We will try to get them to them mostly at the end of the webinar. So we're gonna start the webinar off by taking a quick poll. And you will all get to see the results of this poll. Um, and it is, Currently, your store, and I mean during this coronavirus thing, I don't mean right this minute, but I mean currently during this coronavirus thing, is your store open or closed? And we'd like you to vote, and we're going to share that. And we're going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. Poll will be closed. Let me share those results with you. Okay, so you can see that 98% are open and 2% are closed. So that's kind of close to what we had anticipated. I would not have been surprised to see 99% open and 1% closed. And we'll talk about this um, more coming up. Brandon, does that surprise you at all? Um, actually, I had no expectation there, Karen. That's why I, I wanted us to do this to get a sense of how many people are open, and I'm, I'm very encouraged to see the response. So that's that's very good news. Excellent. We'll have two more polls to help us move forward and uh, know what we're what we're faced with on your side and what what things you're dealing with. So uh, as we go forward, the big question is: Am I an essential business according to my federal, state, and local governments? And, um, oh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. I do that sometimes. Here's the agenda we're gonna be going over. I'm not gonna read this, but this is, these are the questions that Brandon and I have been fielding for the last week or so. And so we're gonna go through these. Um, hopefully something that you, you are interested in will be here. And now, am I an essential business? Brandon, why don't you answer this one? Yeah, I'd like to. This is something that we've been focused on ever ever since the uh, the virus was announced, and they started talking about uh, potential closures and who would be impacted on that. So we identified from uh, Department of Homeland Security that they had established what they call an essential business list, and it's pretty intuitive on the label. That means that this type of business will be critical uh, to help citizens uh, just get get through the virus. So the obvious ones like hospitals and doctors and things like that uh, were, were on the list. But then we drilled down to see that transportation ma and mailing services, including uh, the private sector. So it's not just for USPS, as some people originally thought, that it's any business that has to do with transportation and or mailing. That's either direct outbound shipping or mail receiving. So obviously our industry falls right into that bucket. There's no gray area there. You guys do fit in that. Now there are state level lists and local municipality lists as well. And some of those do not include the mailing and shipping services on those lists yet. I think as they, as they do their research, they will update those to include you. But then we also found out yesterday, and this was a, a direct product of us uh, mailing out the RS News Magazine, we were concerned um, that our printer and our, our mail house that does all of the production work for us would not be able to get the magazine out for us. So we checked, and because they are a print provider, they're also on the essential business list. So for those of you that do the mail and package receiving, that's one box check. But if you do a lot of print services, you actually are on in two different categories. So you are providing what the government views as critical services during this, this time of emergency. So uh, what we've done is post several um, documents, one from the US Postal Service that underscores this. We have the link directly to the DHS and their department that has posted their list 
at rscentral.org under the uh, the virus uh, info piece. We have a whole uh, section on our website dedicated to this. But the best way for you guys to access those, because my strong recommendation to you is to print those out and have them available, have multiple copies, because local bureaucrats often don't know what the rules are. And they may enter your store if you're open for business and say, what the heck are you doing here? You're supposed to be closed just by just like everybody else. So you need those official documents to show them that you're part of the essential list. Otherwise, you might have uh, issues locally. And it's also good for your customers to know that you're not just breaking the law, that you're uh, abiding strictly to the law. So we'll continue to keep everybody updated on that. But uh, I would encourage everybody to stay open now. Uh, uh, under the, the heading of should I stay open, the health and safety of you and your staff and your family is always the most important element of this. So if you deem that because you may be at risk for something like um, like uh, contracting the virus, I, I'm not going to tell anybody not to close down. That's a tough business decision to make. Part of the goal in giving you this info today and ongoing is to make sure that we give you all of the accurate and reliable info so that you can then make well-informed, educated decisions on what you do next. Now, what we, we're hearing around the country is because of this, um, and in many cases, uh, our member stores are the only business open on the block or, or in an entire neighborhood. So. There, we're, we're getting anecdotal reports that you're actually seeing quite a bit of business right now. It may not be the normal routine stuff, but people need you for a lot of things. Um, so uh, the revenue and the sales are still there. Uh, that's not the most important thing. Safety is the most important thing. But uh, closing because you think there's not going to be any business uh, is probably not accurate. And that, there are always going to be exceptions to that. But we'll continue to keep you updated. We check on these sources throughout the day. Not every day, but every every couple of hours we're double checking to make sure that we're providing you with the most accurate stuff. And as we'll re-mention later on in the webinar, the best way to access through, the, through RSA for that is to subscribe to the RSA blog. Uh, everything that we think we know or that we have ver verified or validated is going to run through the blog. So we'll, there will be cross postings on our discussion board. And we'll send a blast email and social media, just like Postalmate is doing. But it's all going to collect in the blog. And you can subscribe to that. So as we update it, you'll, you'll immediately be notified on it. And I understand that blog is pretty new. But is, is this what great timing to have something that gives you immediate current information it, it's been very good for us and we have a lot of activity on it so yes it was a good, very good ad for us so make sure that you do as brandon said have a sign in your front window that designates you as an essential service provider so that you can um so that people i mean in this day and age in some areas that are hardest hit people will get angry if your business is open and they don't think you should be so having that up front and remember not only may you if you are a cmra in particular and have mailbox customers uh you may be getting people's prescriptions in the mail their pension checks their um you know important supplies for diabetes or what have you and don't forget the most important one to your state government the census uh, envelopes. So um, that's that's one of the re many reasons that you are definitely an essential service provider. Now, aside from having a note in the front window designating you as an essential service provider, make sure that you advertise. And this is if there were ever going to be a time that you would do banners, flags sidewalk signs, all that stuff, now is it. Everything is so quiet. If you've gone through your shopping centers in your area, there's no cars and parking lots and stuff. So anytime there is a banner or something, everybody looks now because that's the only activity happening. So make sure when you park, you park uh, your car close to your front door so that people can see which office or you know which which retail outlet is having business there make sure that you get signs many of you have uh, restrictions about signage from your local government or perhaps your landlord but you would be surprised at how much they're they're going to look the other way right now in a crisis situation because you're an essential service provider and so um they could in in truth in some cases there's a possibility they could even be in trouble for enforcing that 
when you're an essential service provider. So uh, go ahead and advertise and do what you can. Okay. I do want to underscore though, Karen, uh, as you do those advertisements and to the point where some customers think that you're, you're doing it as a, um, uh, you're just greedy about money and that's not it. You, you need to be there to serve people right now uh, under very restricted conditions, certainly. But if you do advertise, as Karen says, make sure that in every spot you reference that you're part of the essential business list and thereby are open to serve people accordingly. It's not because you're just there for the money, it's because we need you there now. The, 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 you know, the general population needs what you guys do, but there are some out there that don't pay attention to the rules and they think that you're just breaking the law for money. So make sure that they understand you're there because the government wants you there. That's why you're on that list. Right, so be sensitive to your community. Um, I'm going to take another poll really quickly, and I want you to think about the revenue that's come in your, your store in the last 10 days. Now, I'm going to tell you up front that I am 100% positive that door swings have reduced dramatically. If I had a mailbox at your store and I used to come in every single day to change to check my mail, I probably would reduce that to once a week just so I would reduce my, um, you know, ability to catch the disease from somewhere out there. I would just, cause I'm sheltering in place. So same thing with drop-offs. Well, if I've got a drop-off at home, maybe it can wait a few weeks. So door swings I'm certain have gone down, but let's take a look at your actual revenue. And what I'd like to know, not in dollars, just kind of what are you seeing in your store? Um, do you have more up, up and away? Is your revenue up? Some up, some down, eh, a couple days up, most of the days down or, you know, that. So let's take a look at that. And I think we're going to be a little bit surprised. And the results that I'm seeing are consistent with what I've been hearing from many of you. So we're going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. And I will share. Okay. So Six percent of you, so six, six, you know, that's pretty good. It, are are up, but thirty-four percent up, up some, down some. So you know that's not the worst in the world. Um, but a lot, but some of you are just down a lot. And let's face it, not every area is affected the same. Nampa, Idaho, is not the same as New Rochelle, New York. Um, you know, there are restrictions in some areas that are going to affect more than others. Now let's take a look at the next question that I'm getting and let me hide that. And store hours, should my store have reduced hours of operation? And I, I'm gonna take the last poll right now because it has to do with this. And then I'm gonna let Brandon address um, kind of some store hour ideas, but uh, last poll, because I think these polls, uh, it helps you to know what others are doing. And so let's go ahead with this. My store hours remain the same, have shortened to Monday through Friday. Maybe you used to be open Saturday or part of Sunday. Um, and you can take, you can check mark more than one here. So if you need to check mark more than one, that's perfectly fine. So, and I guess I should have had, I am closed, but we already kind of addressed that earlier. All right, we're gonna close this poll. In five, four, three, two, one. All right, and we'll share that. So I would say a little under half of you have reduced your hours and a little more than half of you remain the same. Brandon? Yeah, there's, this, is, uh, this is an interesting topic and I wanna kind of break it down into, into sections for you. If, if you have made the decision that uh, you're not gonna do new business as usual in the sense that you're gonna be packing and shipping and doing all of the other stuff that you do, but you're highly concerned about uh, your, your mailbox customers receiving their mail and inbound packages that are on a steady flow. That's one group of owners out there. Um, so what we do recommend is if you're not open for regular hours or even abbreviated hours, you do figure out a way 
because this is one of the reasons that you're on the essential business list is because we did a calculation and, and figured out that uh, approximately 14 million Americans use our industry as their way to get mail and packages. So there's a big impact there. And the government has put us on that list in part to make sure those people, those 14 million, um, have the same access to their mail as everybody else does. So uh, what a lot of people that are not transacting regular business have done is set up a two or three hour window in which they've received all of the inbound uh, mail for their mailbox customers and and or packages from the carriers. And they're open during a limited period of time say from 3 to 6 p.m. or 3 to 5 p.m., something like that, and those hours only and only for the purpose of mailbox customers getting their stuff. I would say that at a minimum, you should do that. If you don't do that, um, think of your mailbox customers and how they're going to get their mail. The answer is we don't know how they'll get it because you're their authorized agent. And uh, because of that, they can't even go to the post office and pick up their own mail because the post offices don't have any mechanism in place to separate mailbox 555 from mailbox 777. Uh, they don't sort down to the mailbox number level. It's all one big pile of mail. So you may have to communicate with your local postmaster. You may have to go in and see him or her or the, um, uh, the PO box uh, or the route uh, supervisor to make arrangements to pick up the mail, bring it down, get it sorted down to the box level, and then make it available to your customers. So that's one set. Uh, the other set is people that are remaining open as usual, doing normal transactions, but they have an abbreviated schedule. I, I think that will be driven market by market. You have to trust your best judgment on when people need you the most. And we're not in any position to dictate what those hours should be, nor would I. That's a market-driven decision. So for those of you that have gone to Monday through Friday only, I get it. Uh, you're still going to have mailbox customer issues on Saturday. So you have to be um, aware of that. And, and your customers will probably have some expectation there, too. I'm sure they'll, they will cut you a lot of slack on the availability there. But you should have a plan that you pro uh, prominently uh, distribute and post. And, and in a minute here, I'm going to ask Rut to jump on. For those of you that um, have an RS Store website, which allows you full uh, uh, audit and edit capabilities there uh, to make uh, how to post your amended hours on your, your uh, homepage on your store website to keep your, your customers informed there. But tell them what you're doing. So if you're changing your regular hours, make sure those are prominently posted. Use it in any communication that you might have for them uh, and let them know what, what it is. Because um, if, as long as they're informed, you'll have less friction from them. So uh, I don't want to say, here's the hours I would suggest you keep. Uh, that's not for us to say. It should be driven by the market. Your ability to staff the store and be available there. I know some of you have staffing issues right now. Uh, but uh, as many hours as you can be available to consumers, um, the better. Uh, more hours are better right now. But we also understand that amended hours will, will be in place. So use your best judgment there. Think about your priorities in life and business and then set your hours accordingly. Uh, but minimally, figure out a way. You have to figure out a way for your mailbox customers to access their mails. Otherwise, that's going to be problematic for you going forward. I love this response from Barbara. She says, we're open normal hours, but we are also offering extended early hours for the elderly or immune compromised on request. I think that's lovely. Okay. Um, for those of you, and not everyone on this webinar uses Postal Mate, but I think that most of you do. There is a way that you can just email your mailbox customers if you want to, or your whole customer base that you have emails for. Um, I'm not going to go into Postal Mate and show you, but this is in CashMate, and it's called the Sales and Marketing Tools. So in CashMate, you go to Tools, Sales and Marketing, and then you can choose all customers or just mailbox customers. And then you can send this um, down here. You can actually send an email or you can export to an Excel spreadsheet. Now, I will warn you, we've had a number of stores that have done this and have had issues, and there's two reasons that they're having issues. Number one, in their entry 
of of emails, they've made a boo boo, and that happens. Well, you know, it's going to. Uh, hey, hey, Karen. Put, Karen, sorry to interrupt. You you have the poll still open, and it's on. The oh screen. gosh, I hate it when I do that. Thank you for reminding me. There we go. I do that sometimes. There we are. So I'll go once more. <laughs> Tools, sales, and marketing, and then mailbox customers. They're all telling me, and I'm too busy yakking my head off. I apologize. So uh, the, the two reasons that this can fail is a bad email address. And somewhere somebody has entered Patricia at Gmail, no dot com, or Patricia at Gmail at Gmail dot com. <laughs> you know, we see all kinds of things. And the problem is you may have a lot of customers in there. So I would say if you have mailboxes, start with your mailbox list. If you get an error that says set st string something, blah, blah, blah. That means you have a bad email in there. The other potential error that you could get is one that's a timeout error. And it means that you have so many emails you're trying to send, send at once, it's overwhelming the system. So you might, might wanna break it down. When we designed this, we had no intention that we would have um, stores, you know, that we would have hundreds of stores, perhaps thousands of stores that would all be emailing at once large groups of people. It was designed, you know, for small groups here and there when you wanted to notify of Christmas hours or something. So it's a little bit overwhelmed. We have added some more capacity to it, but if it times out, just continue to try a little bit later and work with it. If it continues to fail, export it on an Excel spreadsheet and use a different email pro uh, program to send an email to those clients. Okay, um, sorry about that guys. Let's talk about your business insurance. So you all have business insurance. The question is, will it or can it help you out in this? And the answer is maybe, um, because your all of your insurances are different. If it's just for a lack of business, my gosh, I'm down 25% this month, you know, can my business insurance help? Because if it is a pandemic after all, the answer is probably no. Lack of business is not generally covered uh, by business insurance. However, if it's a lack of business because the people are coming in, but you don't have anything to sell them, maybe you, you're shortage in supplies or something there, then that generally is covered or often is covered. Uh, you need to read over your insurance contract carefully. And then if you need assistance with that, have an attorney look it over with you. Is that correct, Brandon? Uh, it is. Um, I, I would go to your provider first and give them every opportunity to um, to do the right thing by you. I think insur business um, insurance companies right now are are considering flexing um, how their policy is written because uh, I'm not sure how many of them even offered coverage for something of this magnitude. So give them the opportunity uh, to take care of you first before you go to the attorney. Uh, but but failing that, because we're more often than not, we're hearing that uh, they're getting a negative response from the um, from the car the carriers, the insurance carriers. Um, you, I would encourage you to spend 15 minutes with an attorney that knows something about this, and and get their counsel on it. Uh, I, I'm not a I'm not a fan of litigation, but. Uh, this is a, these are dire straits things. So you may need to you use an, uh, an attorney to kind of uh, shoulder your way through the, through the, uh, the firewall that the insurance providers have set up. Right. Um, but, and some of you yeah, just, just aren't good at reading legalese that's in the insurance policy and need an attorney to interpret it for you and just tell you, okay, you should, this should be covered. That should be covered. Go to, you know, you're on your own now, go to the insurance company and deal with them. And, and then you can get them back involved if you need them, but at least to help you understand what what is covered and what you should be able to get um, is a good idea. And we get a lot of questions about business interruption insurance. And while you may have this, and it may apply in your circumstance, business interruption insurance was originally designed to cover you if you have a hurricane or a tornado and the property is damaged to the point where you cannot function and it has interrupted or a fire, it has interrupted your business. Um, pandemic like this may not apply be, unless your store is directly infected, uh, then, then it probably would. So again, that's something you would need to read carefully and maybe have an attorney advise you on what your policy is telling you. Now a heads up on that too, uh, because you're on the essential business list, 
your insurance provider might might respond and say, well, you're not being forced to close. You're not a restaurant or a bar that has no choice. You do have a choice to remain open. So if you close, that's on you and not us. Uh, I'm not telling you that's what they will say, but pe be prepared for that to be part of the response. We, we all know how insurance companies can behave when they're looking to write lots of big fat checks out there and they may be looking for a way not um, not to extend coverage in, in, in this case. But um, worst they can do is say no, you should ask. So if you're like I was when I was a business owner, um, one of your biggest expenses every month is your lease. And it's really, you've got about a week before you have to cough up that money coming up soon. And if that's troubling you, you can talk to your landlord. We encourage you to talk to your landlord. You're not the only one in your shopping center that's going to have this problem. So there are three potential resolutions to this. <clears throat> and the first is, of course, a rent reduction. So maybe that you pay less rent for a couple of months. He may, he or she may be willing to do that. The second is a rent abatement where you get free rent for a couple of months. That's the best case scenario. We'd all love that. It may happen. I, I assure you, for some of you, it will happen. You will have a very generous landlord. But by and large, your landlord is probably going to want to collect his money because he's owed his money. And he may have, he or she may have obligations like a mortgage on the, on the building. So you may not get out of paying your lease. However, that does not mean that you cannot get some immediate relief. So perhaps a rent deferment. So let's say your rent is $2,000 a month plus $400 in CAMS plus taxes. Um, maybe you and your landlord could come to some kind of an agreement where you pay your CAMS and taxes for three months, but not the base rent of $2,000. Then after that, you pay an extra $500 each month until December where you finish off and catch everything up. He or she may be willing to go for that because first of all, he's getting all his money and he only has to float you for a couple of months. He gets to keep you as a tenant, which is really important with, with all the small businesses that are closing and the unlikelihood that he would ever re-rent that anytime soon. And then finally, at the end of the tax year for him, he'll show that he's collected um, the same amount, which is important for businesses to show on their taxes when they're in the future going to get, um, going to go for loans and stuff for other business purposes. Brandon, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, you covered most of it. My, my view of this is landlords are expecting these calls from their tenants, for, um, everyone. And, and we all have different types of landlords. You may have the big corporate landlord that's part of a real estate investment trust and they couldn't they could care less about you they want the rent no matter what if you're lucky you may have more of a localized hands-on landlord that owns the property and they come by and say hi and they're more there's more of a, a relationship there and for those i think you have better prospects of, of some uh, abatement or allowance here as as karen said and some of that's going to be dependent on how good of a tenant you've been up to this point. But I think every retail landlord out there is, has to have some plan in place because they don't want to come out of this crisis and suddenly not have any tenants. It's far better for them to take a short-term financial hit through abatements or extensions or pure waivers. If it were me, I'd call the landlord and say, hey, uh, I'm not going to be pay, be able to pay the rent next month or, or, or something like that. Uh, are you willing to waive it? I, I would start from there and then and then work your way up. Uh, Karen is far more um, or far less aggressive on that, which, which surprises me. Normally, <laughs> she goes for the jugular on these things. And, and I'm more mm -hmm. of a, expect them to give me a lot because I know that they want me as a tenant. So you kind of have to use that to your advantage right now. Now, for the big corporate um, ones, they're probably going to have some policy in place that will be very strict and will be applicable to every tenant that they have because they have thousands or hundreds of thousands of tenants. So they'll have a policy that's pretty hard line and, and pretty deep in the sand. Uh, but a, a personal phone call to your landlord is far better than an email. It's a lot easier to say hell no in an email than it is with somebody on the phone that is struggling and, and you can tell their, their stress in their voice, et cetera. So uh, avail yourself of that, uh, everybody, and, and just kind of adding on to the piece about your lease, everybody should be doing 
a review of your current cash flow expectations for the next two months. Look at what you have in the bank and then look at what you're spending and figure out what is critical to your business and what is not necessarily essential for your business and then go into some kind of austerity program for, for the foreseeable future, the next two or three months. Keep paying those things that you have to have in order to remain in business uh, and then curtail the other ones. And, and sometimes that can be pretty painful, uh, but everybody should have done that analysis. We've done that analysis at RSA and we're not wasting any money. Every money, every dollar we're spending right now has a reason and a purpose and, a, and an expected outcome. And anything that doesn't meet that description, we're postponing or, or we're not doing. Uh, so do that analysis. Uh, red is obviously your key one, and then your payroll is probably your second highest concern there. And, and we, we have some discussion points on that as well. But ask for a lot on the rent. Uh, the worst you're, they can do is say no. And at this point, a lot of people are saying yes because they're better off than you and um, and they want to come out of, of this with, with tenants. So give them a reason and, and they'll likely give you more than you expect. Exactly. Thank you, Brandon. And and, and he's right. Um, always, always start off with the most and work down to the least. Um, many of you will be pulling out your leases and seeing what... Um, what, what types of things in there? And you might find something called a force majeure. And you, you may have seen this in the news lately. This term has been thrown around. And it's because it's a, a term that's often in contracts for wedding receptions and events and things like this. And, and it's, a, it's something that's almost never used. But I want you to be very, very careful about this clause. Invoking this clause does not get you out of rent. Well, it does, but it's a permanent solution. Invoking this clause cancels the contract. So if you're ready to close your store to now and you feel the need to do that and want to get out of your lease, this would be the clause that would, would potentially get you there without penalty. But for most of us, hopefully everybody on this call, that is not something under consideration. So you may want to ask an attorney if there's any application of this that would help you, but my gut says no. Um, don't go invoking this rule not understanding what this, this clause is. So the next question is, what help is out there for us? And um, I'm going to ask Brandon to tell you a little bit more about the blog in a moment, but let me just share with you, um, SBA, Small Business Administration, just released, I want to say it's $50 million, it's a large number, um, might be bigger than that, of loans immediately available at 3.75% interest rate for small businesses, designated for small businesses, not corporations, but us little guys. Also state and local governments. Um, and when I say, we all know it's state, but we've got individual cities um, coming up with, with programs. Seattle has some, Los Angeles has some, even Salt Lake City has some loan programs out there. Um, I saw, in fact, Salt Lake City has a 0% loan program right now for small businesses that are uh, affected by the coronavirus. That's huge. Uh, banks, the banks are, are kicking in. Um, they, bear in mind that banks have an obligation uh, to, to come forward with high risk loans and they are high risk at low interest rates in times of crisis. That's why there are such things as bank bailouts by the government because we expect them to pan up when things get tough like, like now. So uh, they have an obligation to be out there to help us. And then oddly enough, some corporations are helping small businesses. So I saw an article where um, Amazon is giving small loans to Seattle stores. Um, Facebook is giving some loans out. So strangely enough, some corporations. How do you find all these? Google is your friend. Uh, Brandon, do you want to tell us? Uh, I think you have some of these on your blog. Is that correct? I, I did. I did. Yeah. And I, I want to continue to drive people to their blog. And I saw a couple of questions on there. Um, posted here about how to get to the RS blog. If you go to rscentral.org, and we'll have that URL up on a later screen here, but it's rscentral.org, go to the homepage, look for the blog, and there you go. And all of these resources are, are there. So there's a couple of things on this relief. Everybody, if you have a pen handy, write this down. Uh, what they're referring to um, in Congress right now is called the CARES Act, and that stands for Coronavirus Aid Relief 
an economic security act. That's the bill that uh, right before this, somebody told me that the Senate finally uh, approved it after those knuckleheads um, extracted their heads from the nether regions. Now it has to go to the House, so that'll probably get derailed there. But within that bill, um, as all of these things that Karen's talking about, uh, loans for businesses to help them get over the hump, uh, extended or expanded um, uh, unemployment to help your staff, uh, and I, so everybody needs to be aware of that and read about that. Now, we're camped out on this, so as we learn what it means and where to go, we'll have uh, a pathway posted in the blog telling you guys what to do. But some other um, uh, smart people have told us that there's, there are also, and I think this goes to Karen's point about Amazon and local businesses doing things to help, there are local grants for, uh, that big corporations are, are making that you can apply for to cover your payroll. Uh, there are all kinds of entities out there that are starting to help small businesses like ours get past this. So as, as Karen said, Google should be your friend. We don't have a catch-all for all of these things because they're popping up as things go by. Uh, there's also something in addition to the CARES Act called the EIDL, which is the Economic Injury Disaster Relief Loan Program. So that people that are directly impacted by it can apply for these loans. Um, so you should be uh, aware of that. So the CARES Act and the EIDL uh, act, I don't know if that's an act, but it's a, a relief loan program are available to you. Once we have a sense of the best way for you guys to access the funds that are out there, we'll we'll post that. Uh, there's only so much we'll be able to help you with. You'll be able you'll have to take it from there. Uh, but a good idea, if you think you're going to need relief, go to your bank now or call your banker now and let them know and find out what their protocol is and if they're going to be participating in the government loan programs. Uh, some banks will be able to opt in and opt out of that. So find out if your bank is going to participate in that and what they'll need from you. Another good idea is if you have a standing line of credit with your bank, Go ahead and draw that line of credit right now. Now, I don't mean pull the money so you start paying interest, but trigger the line of credit so it's available if and when you need it. That's the best way to do it, that you have that line of credit available to you with the terms already established with your banker, so that if you need the money, you draw the money. Let's say you have a $50,000 line of credit. You don't draw the whole 50, you draw 10 or five, and you use that money as you need to to keep you going, and then if you need more, you go draw more, and you only pay the interest on the amount that you've drawn down off the, the line of credit. So if you don't already have that, you might want to establish it. If you have it, notify your bank that you're going to be uh, executing the line of credit so that you have the money ready for you. Uh, and bear in mind that there's this money that the SBA has out there, but the SBA, uh, unless it's under a special provision, does not make loans directly. They guarantee the loans that your bank makes. So your first go-to is a bank. Find out if they do SBA guaranteed loans, and especially under this emergency provision, and then do what they tell you to do. Uh, but, but you don't actually go to the SBA to get the money. You get to go to the bank, and then they federally guarantee it through the programs. So you can start taking preemptive steps now, assuming that you are going to need the money. But uh, I've kind of broken it into two categories, money to help small businesses, and they, they may do this a variety of ways, folks. We don't know how it'll manifest yet. They may do it as a payroll tax um, waiver where you don't pay any payroll taxes for a period of time that will help with your cash flow. They may guarantee salaries for people for a period of time. We don't know how it's going to come. So this is one of those times where you must pay attention to the news that's out there. So if you're subscribed to our blog or, or you're a member of ours and we send you an email, please read it. It may have critical info to you, even if you're busy. This is one of those key communication times where you don't overlook something from an organization that may help you. And, and Postal Mate has, uh, has equally robust communications. So if you've um, like blocked your email from RSA or, or unsubscribed because we sent you an email that wasn't important to you at that moment, you may need to go and whitelist us 
If you don't know how to do that, look it up. But you may need to go back and whitelist us because if you've unsubscribed or blocked us, you're not going to get any messages from us. We sent we sent out the uh, the webinar invitation yesterday to our entire membership, and we we identified that 739 people have blocked us from getting an email. And some people often think, well, I'm just blocking you from an email on that one subject matter, but that's not it. If you block us, you're not going to get anything from us. So go back and whitelist us and put it on a, on the approved list. Otherwise, you, you may be subject to uh, missing a, a, a critical piece of information for you. But I, Karen, I think that's what, what we know about this right now. But uh, hopefully, uh, Congress will pass something. And then we'll have a timeline on what that is and when the money is expected to flow. But in the meantime, your homework is to do that cash flow analysis and see how much cash you have and when you're going to run out of money, because that's when you need to have it ready to go. So Thank you, get Brandon. a plan in place. Sorry about that. Karen. Okay. No, that's okay. Um, so a lot of you have some staff that is very dear to you and you may have feel like you have to reduce your hours and reduce your payroll at this time. Uh, but if you feel that you can pick that staff back up after, let's say, six, eight weeks, tw 12 weeks, however long this slow, slower down, slow down lasts, if it, that's what you're experiencing, if they're willing, go and talk to your local drugstore or anchor grocery store and talk to that manager and say, I would like to loan you my employee. Employee is wonderful, has experience in a stock room, you know, packing and, and shipping and stuff like that. And, there's always a position available at grocery stores and drug stores right now because they're being swamped. Um, they would love nothing more than to get an employee who is highly recommended, who is local and reliable, who is really wants a job only while it's critical for them, that they don't have to feel bad about letting go in a few weeks when, when they, it slows down for them. So maybe work something out with your local um, anchors. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about the carriers. Service guarantees have changed. So for UPS, FedEx, and DHL, their service guarantees are suspended, just flat out suspended. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you let your customers know that because your receipts are still going to say, be there th Thursday by end of day or whatever. Um, so make sure that the businesses that you send to are actually open. Um, we had a lot of things clog up the system because things were in route to businesses and the government locally there shut the shut the uh, businesses down and nobody could, was there to receive the packages when they got there. So that's really frustrating uh, the, the carriers. And I'll also tell you, I want you to think about this. Let's just take the state of California, which is virtually shut down right now. Millions of businesses cannot collect their mail each day. And that mail is stocking up and storing up. It's overflowing the mailboxes and it's having to be taken back to the post office. Post, office don't, post offices are not storage facilities. They don't have room to store all the mail for millions of businesses. So they're, they're gonna be really hurting in a couple of weeks as far as mail. So also bear, bear in mind that uh, a good chunk of mail in particular, but all carriers, they use each other's airlines frequently and passenger planes to move the, the mail and packages. And I know Southwest just announced they're, they're uh, going to stop 1,500 flights a day is going to be stopped because of the coronavirus. That Those airlines carried mail before. How is the post office and others going to move that mail if they once relied on uh, those airlines. So everything's going to slow down a bit in transportation. Uh, signature requirements are being adjusted or suspended uh, by the carriers. So uh, if you if your customer wants a signature, they don't want their drivers getting that close to the to the to the end end receiver. And then DHL announced you got should have gotten an email yesterday from DHL announcing that they will have a an emergency surcharge that may apply to your shipments. So I can't speak for any other software, but Postmate is looking at adding this. It goes in effect April 1st, which is a week away, less than a week away. We got the information about one hour before you got the information yesterday, and we still don't have the technical details yet. So we will work very quickly and see if it's something that we can add. 
Um, if so, make sure that you watch it. It may require a, a complete update. It may be able to be something that we e-update. So, uh, but we will send out a notice for that when, if and when we have something available. We are aware of that. Um, also, make sure that you let your customers know that uh, time and transits are suspended. And in Postmate, you do that by going to your shipping disclaimer. And it would be a great place to add a clause in there saying time quoted is not guaranteed or something along those lines. Um, and that's done in CashMate tools, options, register settings, and then receipt layout. So be sure and do that. Okay, so the next thing is accepting things at your store. And this is, this is a real story. I'm gonna let Brandon tell the story if he can do it in three minutes or less. <laughs> Here you go, Brandon. I got you. I can meet that. Okay, so the picture you're looking at on the screen right now, folks, is an actual item that was dropped off at one of our uh, advisory council stores, or they attempted to. And it's a live um, coronavirus test where he'd done his swab, put it in the bag, and he was trying to get it back to the testing facility. And you may not know this, and if you don't, I'm going to tell you, if you're an ASO with UPS or FASC with FedEx, you are contractually prohibited from knowingly shipping hazardous material like this, any biohazard or any kind of hazmat, you're prohibited from knowingly doing that. So Charlie asked us, what do I do? And the only option in this case is to tell the customer they must go to a FedEx or a UPS facility. He was returning it via FedEx. That should not be in your store. Don't accept those. Uh, kindly tell the customer that you're not allowed to handle hazmat. They need to go to a FedEx office or a FedEx man facility, employ, uh, FedEx employment. Do not handle any of these, these tests. Now, this is going to go up a lot as the tests are available and people are sending them back through the mail or other methods. Uh, make sure you're aware of this. And, and have signs posted at your door, and we'll show you some in a minute that you'll be able to use to advise your customer that you're not allowed to do that. How's that, Karen? So, yeah, so in your store, you need to be showing your customers that you're um, adhering to the CDC guidelines and doing the thing, everything that you can to protect them and yourselves. So uh, this is an idea I had and actually had um, Bobby said that he's done this in his store. And that is on your carpeted floor, take the blue masking tape that, that you use for painting and make some lines for the line. And then every six feet, put an X on it so people know how to stand. It's a great gentle reminder to keep social distance. The other thing is we all have things that people touch. Door handles are certainly one. Um, I would, if the weather is good, prop your doors open. Um, but this, the darn credit card machine is another one. Make sure that you wipe those down. And I know everybody's like, well, where do you get wipes? Every, all the stores are out of wipes. I get that. But these little alcohol wipes, those are plenty available. These are the kind that are used for um, injections, uh, for a little swabbies. And they're great for just wiping down the numbers on the pin pad for example. So uh, these can be picked up at Amazon. So grab those, um, those little alcohol wipes. Also, don't feel bad about wearing gloves in your store. By all means, wear gloves. Everything we've read says that the chance of getting the virus from handling a box by somebody who had the virus at some point is very low. It is not zero though. And if you are more comfortable wearing gloves, by all means, I don't think anybody's going to blink twice about you wearing gloves in your store. So that brings us to the question, and I'm getting a lot of questions and it's the same question, so I'm gonna address it all at once here with the next slide. Thank you, Bobby. Um, what about that face-to-face -face contact? And you know, the counter's probably two or three feet away from your customer, but you're gonna to wanna to, you know, keep back a little bit from your customer without being rude. And then the other thing, and Bobby did this in his store and he did a really nice job, sneeze guards. So he's actually gotten some plastic or plexiglass from the Home Depot type store and some wood and look, he did such a nice professional job and that sits on the counter and he's got it on there with Velcro so it doesn't fall off. So that industrial strength Velcro, um, you, you know, most of us could make those or know, know somebody that could make these. And um, I, think it's a, I think it's a really nice looking thing. So let me give you an idea about the question that we're getting asked a lot and that is, what about fingerprinting and live scan? Any of you have a significant profit center that handles people at close range? 
I were I you, I would have a removable one of these, maybe a little bit wider, with the bottom up a little bit so that you could slide your hands underneath, you know, like the old bank teller where you used to slide your hands underneath. And um, and then you be wearing gloves and they slide their hands underneath to do that. And you have this sneeze guard, if you will, protection between you if you continue to do live scan um or um, fingerprinting. If I had a barrier between me and thee, I would have no problem doing uh, a fingerprint, but I just don't want you breathing on me. I want you, you know, I want to be protected from that. So think about doing that. I thought this was a great solution. solution. Now, if you are, and this is a personal decision, if you are immune compromised or have somebody at home that is, and you just don't want to get that close and you want to stop that profit center for the time being, do it, stop it. That's totally a, a personal choice, and I totally respect that. So finally, the next question is, what is my support system? Not mine, but yours, your support system. And so that would be, of course, RS Associates, PC Synergy, the carriers, the credit card, and the suppliers. Here's the good news. Every one of these, because we support an essential industry, we also become an essential industry. So the government will not make us shut down. Um, so we will be there for you as much as we possibly can, as much as in the same way as always that we have been. We have been asked, has this industry ever seen anything like this before? And the closest I can remember to this was 9-11. Uh, and Brandon and I have been in this industry for a stupid long period of time. I've been from eight, 1986 and Brandon, what, 83, 82, 84? 84. 84. So a long, a long time. And 9-11, um, I, I just remember my store was dead for two weeks. I mean, in it, it, it just nobody did any, everybody was so glued to the TV. Nobody came in. Air transportation shut down for a couple of days, but then it started back up, but there was nothing to put on the planes. Nobody traveled and nobody shipped anything and nobody mailed anything. I mean, it was just really weird. Um, that way. So it did affect us really strongly, but it was for a short period of time, maybe three weeks maximum, I, I'd say. This, I think you're getting more business than we did back then, but it's it's going to affect us for a longer period of time. So just different. Do you agree with that, Brandon, for the most part? I, I do. And adding to that, for those that also remember that time, uh, after 9-11, certainly business pretty much evaporated, like you said, but then adding to the uh, to the challenge was the anthrax scare. Some knucklehead was sending live anthrax out in, in mail and mail envelopes and, and packages. So for a period of time in, in the stores that I owned, uh, we couldn't allow customers into the store with a, a sealed package. That was a, a decision we made. So everybody was in respirators and gloves and we took extreme measures similar to what you guys are taking right now, but it got to the point where we had to inspect every package before we would ship it to make sure it didn't have bad stuff in it. So it, it was not near the order of magnitude that you guys are facing right now. And it was kind of a thing that it, as we got used to the tragedy of 9-11, people slowly but surely started going back to their regular routines. But here it's being an enforced lockdown. We don't know when we're going to come out of it. So uh, that's part of the frustration for a lot of people is not knowing how long we're going to last. So we still don't know this. I, I know uh, Trump said yesterday that he'd like to see us come out of it in, in, at Easter Sunday. I, I don't think that's realistic by any stretch. And, and not knowing is part of the frustration. Everybody wants to say, well, when are we going to get past this? And nobody knows that right now. So it adds to the complexity. But this is about as bad as I've seen it for the industry for as long as I've been in it. It is. And and on that, if I had a crystal ball, and I don't have a crystal ball, even though many people call me a witch, <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball. But if I had a crystal ball, um, it would probably show me something like this. And this was news yesterday um, from the UK, but it was about Apple. Now, I got to tell you, I'm a bit of a pessimist when it comes to foreign countries, especially communist countries. So I don't trust the Chinese government as far as I can throw them. But Apple does a lot of business there and they have to, you know, be somewhat, you know, transparent. And they say that their Foxconn uh, factories over there are ramping back up. Now they have 16,000 workers in that factory. They don't have them all back to work yet. 
um, but they are getting back to work and expect production to be on schedule for this fall. So that tells you, and I and and the Chinese government has said that some of their cities are opening. I know I don't know completely if I believe that, but I'll believe Apple. And if this is a sign, if Apple's willing to say they don't expect any delays for the, the new products they've just released, then that tells us that things are getting back to normal in China. I don't know, we're what, four, six, eight weeks behind China. So it looks like maybe we have a little bit more to go through before we start seeing recovery. Um, they started adding workers back in mid-February in China, and here it is late March. So, you know, it might be only another six weeks of down, and then we start to recover. I'm hoping that we'll mimic that in some way. And let's face it, um, medical science is doing amazing things. They're, they're working hard to come up with a, 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 a cure, a vaccination, a something. So uh, some kind of help. Once all those things transpire, then I think we'll be well on the path to recovery. And um, I'm, we're gonna get to questions in just a minute. So if you wanna go ahead and continue adding those questions in, this next slide, I'm gonna let Brandon completely talk about. So if you don't already know this, we, uh, we're trying to give you as, much, uh, as many resources as we can to, to help guide you through this. So we had Peter create the signs that uh, we're showing on this slide right now. And as we've been saying, make sure your customers know what you're doing as a result of this. And the best way to do that is put these signs everywhere in your store. There's no cost to do this. You go to rscentral.org and you can download a file and then print as many of these as you want. But we think you should do this right now, especially if you're gonna be open. Uh, and, and the signs speak for themselves. It uh, gives that message uh, to your customers, and I would put these right on the front door, inside the front door, post them throughout your store so the customers know you're taking the proper steps uh, to keep your store uh, as, as clean as you can. Uh, you're taking the procedures to protect them and your staff. Uh, it, it states that you can't take the hazmat or the clinical packages. Uh, so post these. Just go to rscentral.org. We've got the uh, the URL there at the bottom of the slide. And as I said, there's no cost. This is just to help you guys. So get them out there, print them. Um, if there are other signs that you think might be helpful, send us an email to customercare at rscentral.org and be specific. Uh, Peter, uh, Peter is our, our graphics guy and he's very talented. Uh, we can create anything you want us to. Uh, and if it would be good for you, chances are it would be good for others. So we'll uh, we'll keep it in the resource section for you. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, finally, we're going to get to a slide that is a little bit light. And I just want to say th this this fellow, most of you know, um, he likes to make light of things, and his customers fortunately know that about him. So hopefully they, they wouldn't take this the wrong way. Now, this is not appropriate for all of your locations, but he sells engraved products in his stores, and he does the engraving. And so he's created kind of a, a, a bunch of products where you know it's basically we're all in this together. And I thought that we could just share a light moment um, because alcohol works better than peroxide or my COVID-19 survival mug. And we know the thing. And for some of you, this is too early, but for some, some of you that like to bring a little bit of lightness and levity to the situation, I'm one that has to laugh about everything. Anything bad that happens, I make fun of it. That's how I get through a crisis. But other people, they're, they're more solemn about things and I don't have a reverent bone in my body. So, um, so it, it, if it works for you, I thought it was really cute. Uh, and thank you, HW, for sharing that. We're going to get to some questions now. Now, we have a lot of questions. Um, we have several. Um, if you want Brandon specifically to answer the question, start the question with B and then ask the question. If you want Karen to answer it, start with K. If you don't care, just type in your question. Um, we're going to ask Rhett to help out in sorting these. You can imagine with a, with 500 of you on board and many of you asking several questions, we have a ton to go through. So we're just going to go through. Rhett, would you please um, make sure if they're asking for someone specific that you tell us so? I sure will, Karen. Uh, well, first question I have here is from Dave. Um, do we think UPS will waive their $200 threshold seven-week average for drop-off income? 
My guess is there's going to be some kind of a tear freeze, but I don't, I think it's too early. I don't think anybody's had a chance to talk to them about that yet. Brandon. Yeah, I agree with Karen. Uh, I think everybody is taking this stuff by prioritizing, right? And, and that's very far down the priority list. But, but I would feel safe in saying that everybody's going to make adjustments on expectations and, it, and and they know that if you're forced to close because of something like this, you're not going to have any business. There's no way you're going to hit your tier for anything, drop off payment or otherwise. So I would fully expect some kind of an abatement on any of the, the volume requirements for drop off payment or uh, your discounts. Uh, we just don't have that yet. And we're asking them every day, and they're v being very good at communicating to us what new policies or change or adjustments that they've made, and, and we'll post them. The minute we get something that we can verify and validate and document, we'll post it on the blog so you guys will have access to it. But right now, we don't have an answer to that. Yeah. Um, this is a question for either of you. Um, it's a good question. If we have to close for a period of time due to health, say uh, somebody gets infected in our one of our employees and we're we're forced to shut down for a period of time, what how should we handle our box holders getting mail? That's a tough one. Um, you could of course forward the mail to their current address. Um, Brandon, do you have some ideas on that? Well, if, if you're actually closed and you can't physically show up the, to the store, and, and if it, and I want to make sure that uh, this may be a frog here on the on the ask. If you yourself are sick, you're you're exposed or you're under quarantine, then obviously you cannot be there for your customers. Um, so what I would try to do is get somebody else to be there. I I would make extraordinary, um, go to extraordinary efforts right now, um, not to uh, impede the flow of mail to your customers. So that means uh, if you have a friend, a relative, a neighbor, or somebody else that could simply go sort mail and give it to people during a prescribed and posted period of time, I would do that. Failing that, I would immediately get in touch with your local postmaster um, and, or, or the, um, uh, the carrier route supervisor, whoever's in charge of getting the CMRA mail to you guys, and ask them what provisions they might have in place for people to come get their mail. And I'm, I'm going to make this up because I've seen it before in times past, so, so don't take it as gospel. They may put all of your mail for your store in a tub, and then it's up to you to sort it down to the box level, which is typical. What they may do is put the mail in a tub and let your customers go to the post office and rifle through your mail, through all of the mail, to find their own. There's a high risk in that. Um, it's not supposed to be done, but, uh, you know, stressful times cause for stressful measures. They may do something like that, but I would do, I would go to extraordinary measures not to impact uh, your customer mail volume if you can. But if you simply can't be there, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it, then I would post something on the door stating that at this time, your mail is not available to you. We expect that by this date and have a date that you can live with, it should be, and we apologize for the inconvenience and all of that. And then you just got to deal with the, um, the fallout from it. And folks, you all have the ability, if you are a CMRA, of requesting to pick up your mail at your local post office. So if your store is closed, you could have your neighbor or friend uh, you could make arrangements with the postmaster of going him going him or her going and picking up that mail each day and maybe sitting you know sitting out on a card table in front of your store and sorting it and and say letting all your mailbox customers know that between 10 30 and 11 they can come pick up their mail uh, and they can walk up to the to the table something like that right um this is just a statement from hw the post office came by and gave us a bunch of the president's guideline cards. We copied them and are handing them out to the to our customers. That's a good idea. Good. Uh, okay, I'm going on down with. Um, this question is from Lene uh, uh, to Brandon. Do you feel that reducing our hours will make it more difficult to practice social distancing with more customers in a shorter period of time? Well, the answer is probably yes. 
I mean, this is the balance, Lene. Um, if you're contracting your hours down to a four or five hour window that would normally be nine and you have the same number of customers, then the math would indicate that yes, it's packed. And that's all the more reason to, to post signs and have some kind of a control measure. And that may include posting somebody at your door and just simply asking customers to wait their turn. Please stand out there and, and let them come in one at a time or, or if you have room in your store to, to keep them well spaced and you have three or four in there at a time and not, not be too close. I mean, this is, there is no, there is no, you must do it this way at this point. This is you guys using your judgment to figure that out. I'm describing what I would do if I was in your shoes. I would have one of our staff members at the door handing out the cards, as HW said, have the sign up there so you can refer to the signs. And any printed material you can have that will help people understand your policy and your hours, I would be handing that to every single customer. Use your direct email contact and any other digital method uh, to let your customers know that. And, and I just reminded myself, Rhett, I want you to jump back on here. I said uh, Rutt would come on and tell you guys how to get to your RS store website to post that. This is one way you can keep your customers informed on your, your, your COVID-based policy and your amended hours or adjusted hours. So this is for those of you that have a, your, your web presence through the RS store website program, and that's a lot of people. So uh, it'll probably impact a lot on the call here. Uh, Rutt, take just a second and explain to them the best way for them to do that. Uh, sure, Brandon. You have several options on the on our the RS Store websites of getting the message out. Um, one of the best uh, for quick messages is there is a what's new ticker option for it, um, and you go into your management panel and just select the what's new ticker, and you can then go in and add uh, different items uh, uh, like messages that you want to announce to your uh, to your customers, and it will uh, be like a ticker across the top, uh, right across the top, right below the menu. And towards the top of the page that will go across and uh, you can have a link to off to a, more information if you would like you can put put a beginning date and ending date when you want it to start and end so it's a very powerful uh, little quick uh, thing to do um, but also you might want to change you know you may be changing your store hours as we've been discussing and if it's going to be a fairly long-term thing you may want to just update your regular store hours but as an alternate to that you can also uh, use what we call the holiday store hour feature where you go in week by week and put the hours that you're going to offer for that whole week and then it'll only apply to that week so if you're going to be uh, having altered hours for the next three weeks you could go update three separate weeks uh, on, within the system telling it what the new hours are and then those hours will be displayed for those three weeks and then after those three weeks it'll just automatically go back to regular hours that's what we call our holiday store hour feature um, and like I said, uh, anywhere you could have another page dedicated to to what you're doing or a lot of information uh, that if you have a lot more than you can put in a little ticker or a quick message and just create another page. You don't have to ha put it in the menu. You can just have a page with all the information and then put a link to it on your home page or in the ticker, like I said. So like I said, you have lots of options. If uh, you're not sure how to do some of these, don't, don't hesitate. Give us call, contact RSA and uh, we can point you where to, to the right information on how to do some of these things. Thanks. Yeah. Ask, ask for ask for Tanya and Tia, Tanya or Tia, if you call. Uh, there are um, our support team that will help specifically on your store website stuff. Thanks, Rhett. Cool. Um, I have there's a I have a statement from Barbara here, and I think this is really great customer service. Uh, we're open normal hours, but we're also offering extended early hours for elderly, immune compromised on request. Uh, great idea to to really put out uh, extra uh, customer service and try to uh, the the help the elderly and the people that are most um, um, at risk during this crisis. And just a heads up, everyone, you will um, get an email from me later on today, from actually from the webinar program, with a link that allows you to rewatch this if you missed any of, of the early part or anything or want to see it again for some reason or show somebody else. Um, that will be coming out later this afternoon. Um, this question's for you, Karen. Using the marketing tool is great, 
but it only allows for text emails only. No, uh, no photos are accepted. Is there a way around that? There's not through our program, and that's just simply because of the amount of space um, available. But you can export those emails and use a separate email program to uh, get your message out if you need to add a picture. And we might be just about to wrap it up. We might have a few more questions, but before I forget, because I do often forget these things, I want to say a great big thank you to Brandon Gale of RS Associates for joining me today. Uh, his willingness to participate has been wonderful. I've taken up more than a half a day of his time. And Rut Scarborough, who is busier than anybody <laughs> over there, I want to thank him for pitching in with the questions. You couldn't ask for a better helper in knowing what's what. Rut knows everything there is to know about everything having to do with this industry. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today. Well, Karen, I'll right back at you. And I want everybody to know that the reason we're doing this in tandem is because our, our organizations have, have mutual goals. Uh, without you, our customers out there, we have no business model. So our focus from RSA's perspective, I'll let Karen speak on behalf of PC Synergy and Postalmate, is to do everything in our power right now and focus all our energy and all of our resources on making sure you guys have what you need to give you the best um, the best possibility of surviving this crisis and coming out of it with really good prospects going forward. That's it. That that I, I don't have a number two. That's our goal right now. So we're going to continue on that path and do things like this and whatever we need to to make sure you're properly informed so you can make those good decisions. So I would encourage you guys to stay on all of the uh, social media groups that are uh, with others from the industry, go on the RS discussion board and talk amongst your peers, follow the blog, stay informed on this stuff, don't make blind decisions about it. Make it from an informed position and inform your customer and inform everybody locally. And this is not good, it's bad, let's call it what it is, it's a horrible thing. Uh, uh, but if we work hard on the issues and identify what they are and then work through them, I think we can come out of it okay. We're not gonna come out of it in great shape, but we'll come out of it okay. And uh, thanks, Karen, for inviting us to do this with you. And we'll be happy to do it any time. Thank you very much. Everybody, we're going to uh, end the webinar. We're 15 minutes after. Um, Rhett might have a, another quick, do you have another comment or quest, question, Rhett? I have, do have one important question I don't think I heard covered, and it is important. How does the signature, uh, signature suspension affect the package insurance we sell? Ooh, that's Karen, a I'll, good I'll take, question. Go ahead. I'll, I'll take that yeah. one if you don't mind, because we, we, you know, because of RS package insurance, we've been going back and forth and back and forth, and this has been literally dozens of messages going back and forth because the third-party insurance providers, and I, I think the uh, the carrier direct uh, declared value coverage will be covered by their their policy. So I'm 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 addressing the third-party insurers like RS package insurance, ship and insure and uh, the other one that I'm forgetting right now, for, forgive me for that. But they, each of those companies have uh, policy restrictions when you're sending higher value items that may mandate that you must get a customer signature in order for the, co the uh, coverage to be in place. So with FedEx and UPS going to their new signature rules that does not require a signature, they are doing something where the FedEx driver has to communicate with the recipient and acknowledge that they are who they are in lieu of a signature. And for RS package insurance, they have built that into their coverage now so that as long as FedEx does what they say and UPS does what they say regarding the signature requirement, then the policy and the coverage will remain in place. Now there's there's some big ifs there, and when you're dealing with insurance companies, it's always a little bit dicey. But they are intensely aware of the circumstances here, and during this time, and and because of those pressures, I'm I'm asserting that those insurance providers are going to do everything they can uh, to allow for the coverage to remain in place, knowing what the the restrictions are. So any any case where they may say no, we're going to deny a claim because FedEx didn't actual get, actually get a physical signature. We're going to go to bat for that, and we're going to make sure that they don't use that as a reason to deny coverage on something that would otherwise be covered because everybody did what they were supposed to do. So I would advise everybody, if your provider 
requires a signature in order for your coverage to be in place, follow that procedure to the letter of the policy and you should be safe. I'll stop Thank right there much. unless Rudd has something to add to that. But yeah, well, and I will add to it. There is, you know, there, it is a misconception. They uh, most of the everything I've read, at least from FedEx and UPS, they haven't actually suspended signature required. What they've stopped doing is taking a live signature. Whenever a signature is required, that driver is supposed to be talking to the person over uh, in the door, verifying their name before turning over the package, and then documenting who they who they spoke to. They're just not touching anything. That so they don't get that tra possible transmission of a of the virus because they had the uh, the person sign their uh, their their electronic pad. So that's a difference. It's not actually suspended. It's just a different change of the of how they're handling signatures. So the carrier websites have information, more information about what their what their processes are and what changes are, there are. And let's face it, they're happening regular. I know that RS is going to stay on top of this and post things to the blog as they learn about them. You guys are a big factor in that. Um, even even if they find it fast, you guys seem, some one or two of you guys always seem to find it faster and let us know. So we appreciate that. Uh, we, we are going to end this now because we are a quarter past the hour, but we want to thank you for everything. I, again, want to thank Brandon and Rhett for all of your help today. The last question we had was, will there be a follow-up to this webinar? Will we have another webinar? And the answer is maybe. So stay tuned to your emails. I appreciate you all. I'll sign off for now and okay. say goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Karen, have a great day. Karen, bye -bye. one last yes. thing before they go. Remind yes. them that you've got this recorded. You'll have it available. And Karen's also sharing the recorded version with RSA, so we'll have it in our recorded webinar library as well. So if you miss That's part cool. of it or join late, you'll be able to view the thing in its entirety. All right. Yes. Thank you, and everyone. I'd like to add one thing. Uh, uh, Karen, one run through. We did not get to all questions. We were overloaded with questions because of the number of people and the particular subject. So, if anything, if you still have a question that you didn't get answered, um, that we didn't get to, especially if you asked it, please, if you still need an answer, contact us. We can try to get you the answer. Contact RSA. I'm sure you can contact Karen uh, at, at PC Synergy. But if there's still questions outstanding, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks, Rhett. All right, everyone. We really are signing off now. Take care. Bye-bye.